Good evening, everyone. It's my honor to be the first to welcome you to the Gwynn Center's second annual Gallagher Dialogues with this year's focus on AI and public policy. My name is Christine Gallagher, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Kenny Gwynn Center for Policy Priorities, as well as your Master of Ceremonies for this evening. Perhaps you noticed, but we do have a large crowd tonight, which is a good problem to have. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, if you would, be so kind as to move to the center of your aisles. If there are any available seats next to you, go and squeeze in if you can, if you're willing, to expose some of those available seats on the aisles so that people still standing in the back can find a spot more easily. It's a big crowd shuffle, that's what we like to call it. It's a good reason to get cozy. All right, it's such a joy to see so many familiar faces out in the audience tonight. And speaking of familiar faces, you may have noticed a few other familiar faces and voices here on the screen just moments ago, the Beatles. Now, for the benefit of those who, uh, those in the audience who might be blessed with, let's say, youth, um, I'll go ahead and give you a little primer on the Beatles. The Beatles, were a Brit hey, I was 11 years old when I caught onto the Beatles, so you know, it counts. The Beatles were a British rock band popularized in the 1960s whose musical innovations transcended music itself and transformed the culture at large. Like any band though, the Beatles eventually did break up and I will leave it to the most devoted fans in the room to argue the finer points as to why that occurred. But they went their separate ways and sadly, two members passed away well before their time, making the idea of a coveted Beatles reunion all but impossible. However, this is not the end of the story. In 2021, the production company responsible for the Beatles documentary, Get Back, used machine learning to take dis distorted, decades-old John, dem John Lennon demo tapes and clean them up into usable vocal tracks an innovation powered by, you guessed it, artificial intelligence. The song that we just heard, Now and Then, evoked a mixed response. On one hand, those who knew and loved John Lennon said he would have relished giving his new music life through technology. And others have noted being moved by the song, saying that the technology used to create it expands possibilities, allows us to transcend boundaries, and even in some ways to resurrect the people, the relationships, and the memories we sorely miss. On the other hand though, Paul McCartney himself asked if this AI assisted reunion was quote, something we shouldn't do, knowing that John Lennon hadn't necessarily written the song for that purpose. Critics of the technology have asked if AI will continue to unlock and accelerate the trend of remixing and rehashing or outright stealing intellectual property for profit, replacing and exploiting human effort. This song is just one example of the tension surrounding artificial intelligence, and it exposes the question we must ask ourselves about AI. At the end of the day, does AI help make us more human or less human? And while this is the central question of the topic of AI and one worthy of grappling with, we may not find that answer tonight, believe it or not, but what we do have tonight is dialogue. This evening, we'll tackle some of the implications of artificial intelligence, the ways it's already impacting our lives, and discuss what policy solutions may provide guardrails and guideposts along our way. And with that, we have an exciting program for you tonight, starting with a word from our board chair, together with honored guest Daphne M. Hooper. And then next, we'll dive into an interactive survey and tonight's dialogue with our executive director and special guest, Russell Wald, followed by a time of interactive audience Q&A. Now, if you look at the screen right now, you will notice a QR code. This QR code will give you access to this evening's interactive elements. So please feel free to scan it now if you would like, or you can wait until later. 
We'll definitely give you instructions as we go, so, so no pressure at this moment. And to end the night, we'll head back down uh, to the downstairs uh, first floor atrium in order to enjoy some desserts and some dialogue. And um, as you get settled in this evening, uh, you should have found a program sitting on your chair, and I encourage you to refer to that if you have any questions about the goings on from this evening. And finally, it's my honor to invite Gwyn Center Board Chair Phil Satry to the stage to welcome you. He's one of the Gwyn Center's co-founders and strongest champions, as well as a force for good across the Silver State. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you, Christine. Um, I do remember the Beatles. Uh, they played at the Cow Palace in 1964 when I was living in the Bay Area. I was 15 years of age. My brother, older than me, got to see him. I didn't get to. I've never forgiven him. <laughs> but I do want to welcome you to the 2024 Gallagher Dialogues at the beautiful Nevada Museum of Art. And as Christine said, my name is Phil Satry, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Kenny Gwynn Center for Policy Priorities. I want to thank all of our elected officials, university leaders, board and advisory council members, friends and family, for taking time out of your busy schedules to engage in dialogue over this important topic. And a nod to you, Governor. Thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the Nevada Museum of Art is located in the Great Basin on the occupied territories of indigenous people. The state of Nevada consists of 28 federally regulated, recognized tribes and four nations. The Numu, Northern Paiute, the Nui, Western Shoshone, the Washushi, the Washishu, pardon me, Washo, and Nuwu, Southern Paiute. Please join me in welcoming Daphne M. Hooper, Director of Indigenous Relations at the University of Nevada, Reno, as she comes to the podium for an open blessing. Please, Daphne, join us here. Thank you. Pijat Yongona. Na Daphne Hooper, me Nania, na agai da kada tibuti da kada no. So good evening. My name is Daphne M. Hooper. I am a member of the Walker River Paiute Tribe and a descendant of the Arrington Paiute Tribe. I hate to do this, but would y'all like to stand up? <laughs> this blessing was uh, taught to me by a Pai uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute Elder Ralph Burns. Tamana matza, no kohima mataba we do. Pija u katabino ti kiasi. Uwa nama u pija u kuti. Noko yasama punidu sutuhai. Ti na tuni tui na pija sutuhaina. Mama kunumi numa tuni tui noqua. Ti pia tipu, ti paa, ti songana quana. Noka hatitami na nua ad quetu, mani punidu sutuhai. Pija tu mia, puwa, puwa. Creator God, maker of all things, thank you for giving us this day. We have a lot to be thankful for. Bless everyone gathered here. Blessings for our language. With it, we will teach others. Bless our Mother Earth, our water, our air. Bless everything around us. Go in a good way. Amen. Peace out. Thank you, Jeff. So you might ask yourselves, why are we talking about artificial intelligence? And I thought I'd just spend a moment telling you how we uh, landed on that topic for this Gallagher Dialogue. And, and it really began with a discussion last summer of our board of directors getting input from all of the board members on what topic we might want to have as a discussion uh, topic and, and what the board unanimously agreed upon is that we wanted to have 
this particular topic. And, um, and that has proved to have grown exponentially since we made that decision. Uh, that topic, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, the American Medical Association, uh, high school pamphlets, I mean, it's the topic of this particular era. So I reached out to a former colleague and friend uh, and also a, a UNR grad and um, native Nevadan named John Echemendi. Uh, John now is a co-founder of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. And when I told him what we wanted to do, he generously offered his leading expert in AI and policy, Russell Wald, and we couldn't be happier to have him here tonight as our guest and speaker on this topic in particular. We hope you enjoy the dialogue, the good food, and new and old friends, and thank you very much for coming tonight and supporting us. Thank you so much, Phil, and thank you, Daphne. It bears repeating, and you'll hear this chorus of gratitude over and over and over tonight, but we are so grateful for your support. The business of being a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy research center truly takes a village. Over the past year, the Gwyn Center has grown from a team of three, yes, three, to a growing force of seven full-time staff, in addition to part-time policy analysts, interns, and faculty research partners across the Silver State, and even internationally. And this expansion is intentional, and it is urgent. Nevada needs unbiased, data-driven, trusted policy solutions to address our most pressing issues. And the reason the Gwynn Center was founded was to meet this very need. We exist to put facts and unbiased, balanced analysis, independent and free of political influence, at the center of our policy conversations, whether those conversations are happening in the halls of the Nevada legislature, at the water cooler, or around your kitchen table. And your support of the Gallagher Dialogues helps us fulfill this mission. And for that, I acknowledge you and I thank you. I also want to acknowledge and thank the people and organizations who have taken a special interest in ensuring our work continues and to whom we have to give all of the credit uh, for making this night possible. Please join me in recognizing our incredible Gallagher Dialogue sponsors. Our silver sponsors, Phil and Jennifer Satry, Mary Kay Gallagher, and the Tang Foundation. Mountain Bluebird sponsors, Comstock and Wynn Resorts. Our special event sponsor, the Nevada Museum of Art. Our Sagebrush sponsors, Gorlick Real Estate Advisors and Google. And finally, I want to recognize the groundswell of support that we received from our nine turquoise sponsors and 11 sandstone sponsors. Please give all of them a much deserved round of applause. And with that, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Executive Director Jill Tolls to the stage. She's the Gwynn Center's trusted leader, tonight's trusted guide, and my trusted friend. Join me in welcoming Jill. This is amazing. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Christine, for those incredible opening words. Thank you, Chair Satry, and thank you, Director Hooper, for that incredible blessing uh, for tonight. Thank you to the Nevada Museum of Art for hosting us and for being flexible when we sold out three weeks ago. And then we moved the food downstairs so we could add more seats to have all of you here. Thank you so much.
As you can already see, tonight would not be the evening that it is without the support of our sponsors and our amazing board. And I am going to go ahead and do it. Happy birthday, Greg Brower. <laughs> Our advisory council and our very, very talented team at the Gwynn Center. We truly could not do any of this without our ever expanding and talented team. Christine Callagher and Frankie Talbot worked tirelessly to take care of every detail for tonight. And we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do making, uh, doing deep dive policy research without our incredible research team led by Mike Stewart and by our research analysts, our directors, and our faculty partners, graduate students, and interns. If you are part of our research team and our Gwynn Center team, and are you and our faculty and graduate students and interns, would you please stand? We are so proud of our affiliation with the University of Nevada, Reno. My alma mater, go pack! Yes. <laughs> and it's an honor to partner with President Brian Sandoval and Provost Jeff Thompson to help to transform our state and our world through top tier research. We could not do this work without you and the executive leadership support our deans, our faculty, and students who joined us tonight. And I want to provide a special welcome to the talented faculty at UNR who's with us tonight who focuses on artificial intelligence. Thank you. We are also proud to have Truckee Meadows Community College President, Dr. Karin Hilgerson, and Desert Research Institute President, Dr. Kamud Acharya, and Dr. John Valerie White with UNLV's Boyd School of Law, along with Regents Carol Del Carlo and Joe Arascata, and leaders from across Nevada Department of Education, Washoe County School District, and agencies across our state. Thank you for being here. We often say at the Gwynn Center that we are here for an audience primarily of 63 plus one, our 63 legislators plus our governor. And we also do our policy research to help inform the rest of the executive branch, our state agencies, community groups, advocacy, and the public. And we could not do our work without your input and support. And we are so grateful to any of you who serve in public office. As a retired politician myself, I know what a thank thankless job it can be, and we want to say a resounding thank you for your service. I'd like to acknowledge Assembly Members Natha Anderson, Jill Dickman, Selena LaRue Hatch, and Angie Taylor, who are here from the legislature. Thank you for your service. We also have retired public servants, Regent Jill Derby, a founding board member of the Gwynn Center, Senator Julia Ratty, Senator Ben Keefer, and Attorney General Frankie Sudo Papa. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and Governor Lombardo, I know that you had to work so hard to get here, circling in a plane just praying that it would land and that you have so many pressing demands. We are beyond grateful that you chose to be here with us tonight and thank you for serving the state of Nevada. Our Secretary of State, Cisco Aguilar, thank you for being willing to take on such an incredibly important role in an election year. We're so grateful for your service. Treasurer Zach Conine, who is everywhere, all the time, doing all the things. I think that was an Academy Award winning movie last year, but uh, with your ability to be all over the place, uh, doing good things for the state, thank you for being here. And uh, a Rodell Fellow, uh, another Rodell Fellow with the Aspen Institute, thank you. 
And my former colleague in the legislature and friend, controller Andy Matthews, thanks for making the trip up here. We really appreciate the work that you're doing in the state as well with transparency and maybe even a little bit more technology as we move forward. Thank you. AI has dominated the headlines and captured our imaginations with all the promises of the good that it can do and the fears about the damage that it can do. I actually did have one senator who didn't make it tonight say, are you going to talk about Skynet? No, I'm serious. Is it going to take over the world? <laughs> we may get there, right, Russell? But I, I, I think that he'll, he'll, he'll share some insight on, on that. Uh, although it's been all the buzz this past year, Artificial intelligence is not a new concept. In fact, some credit ancient Greeks for first terming automation back in 400 BC. And then, of course, Alan Turing started the conversation with talking about computer, machinery, and intelligence in his seminal work. John McCarthy is the one who's credited back in 1956 with coining the term artificial intelligence at Dartmouth College. And the late 50s, 60s, and 70s have laid the foundation for programming language, for machine learning, and for the first chatterbot, which we affectionately now call a chatbot. The first driverless car, I was surprised to learn, was invented in the 1980s, before AI got relatively quiet. And then in the late 90s through the early 2000s, we saw AI agents such as IBM's Deep Blue win its first national chess championship against a chess champion, and Apple's Siri come onto the scene. Over the past decade, the widespread expansion of artificial general intelligence led to an explosion of interest, particularly thanks to the release of OpenAI's ChatGPT in late 2022. All these advances have stirred ethical, practical, and policy questions around the uses and the benefits and the risks of artificial intelligence on everything from medicine to environmental sciences and education to its potential impacts on the workforce, government processes, and individual data collection. Before we dive into tonight's dialogue with our guest speaker, we thought that it would be appropriate to have a dialogue with you using an automated online resource. So if you will, take out your phone and scan the QR code, or if you would prefer, you can go onto your web browser and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and you're going to put, <laughs> and you're going to enter the code 28716835. And we're going to do a live audience survey, and you'll get to see the results on screen using just a little bit of AI to configure some word clouds and some of our responses. After tonight, just so you know, we will capture all of your feedback and we will send out the summary of this survey to you as a thank you for participating. <laughs> so I'll give you one more moment to log on, and then I'll walk you through a series of questions. And this will be my chance to pretend that I'm a meteorologist for the night. <laughs> Let's start with an easy basic. What's one word or short phrase that comes to mind when you think about artificial intelligence? Now you'll notice that it's thinking. And you'll see that some words are larger than others. That's because when a word repeats, more and more of you keep using that same word, it bubbles to the top and takes more prominence. <laughs> and I see already, we have everything from opportunity to scary, to powerful to world domination, <laughs> curiosity, uncertainty, potential, productivity, optimization, 
data, a tool, displacement, unprecedented. Robots, robot, and our favorite Skynet for my sci-fi friends out there. Fantastic. Moving on to the next question. How much do you know about AI? Be honest. Would you say you're an expert? Would you say enough to get by with small talk? I'm a novice, or I'm not so sure. Welcome to the experts in the room. We are so grateful and can't wait to hear your questions. <laughs> and to the humble in the room who say you're not sure, and to the rest of us who can pretty much fake small talk. What excites you the most about AI? Pick a word. <laughs> Nothing. I came for the food and I heard there were drink tickets. Okay. <laughs> Scheduling my meetings. I don't see it yet, but could somebody please give us a hand with email? And the answer is yes. So we start to see some themes beginning to develop. I will note this, this part of the program is not moderated. So. <laughs> And I'm loving all the likes. And by the way, if you're enjoying this evening, please, if you're on social media, please put out on X, I still call it Twitter, or, your, or LinkedIn or social media about the evening, hashtag Gwyn Center. Productivity, efficiency, opportunity, rising to the center of that word cloud. But everything with helping with neurodivergence, uh, cheaper government, efficiencies in government, right? Uh, imagination, progress, possibilities, working less, less busy work. I'm hearing some themes here. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next one. Which AI topics interest you the most? And on this one, we've allowed you to answer up to three times. All of the above is not an option, but we do encourage you to pick your one or two. And we will use this, actually. Um, as we look at what we're going to research in this year. So AI in education, in healthcare, arts and culture, business and industry, and in government. There's some very exciting things we're gonna talk about with healthcare. You're gonna see that business and industry, education, government, that's a good thing. For Tim Galuzzi, our CIO, who's in the audience tonight. All right. And then certainly there are impacts and also opportunities within arts and culture. What frightens you the most about AI? You can pick a word or a phrase. The Terminator. <laughs> I will say that this is the one time in my life where my lifelong love of sci-fi has really paid off. <laughs> I was doing research, really, watching all those movies. So to the center, you start to see, coming to the forefront, deep fakes, misinformation, control, certainly some frightening examples in recent weeks in the media. Uncertainty, a loss of critical thinking, a loss of humanity, privacy and misuse, bias and fraud, many of the things that we hope to dive into tonight. Which AI policy areas concern you the most? Is it national security, privacy and data protection, bias and discrimination, workforce impacts, education impacts, intellectual property and copyright, deep fakes and misinformation. I can think of some of the first policy recommendations we might work on. 
So definitely rising to the top, deep fakes and misinformation followed closely neck and neck with national security and privacy and data protection. In order of priority, who's responsible to regulate AI? Is it the federal government, the states, industries, or individuals? <laughs> Get to see it live and in action, isn't it fun? Watch them battle it out. the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> it's, it's all on you, Andy and Zach. Everybody, this is secretly, this was my question to see how many libertarians we had in the room. Uh, I will tell you, we did this with the tech team beforehand and uh, it was a very strong libertarian crowd. It was all the individuals. So a combination uh, but certainly a great deal of emphasis on the federal governments and a place for industries and states and individuals to play a role. I want to thank Corrado from Comstock. Corrado, where are you? Thank you for enlightening me about this tension that exists in the AI world between the accelerators and the decelerators. And so we're going to ask the question, when it comes to accelerating or decelerating AI, should we be go full speed ahead, pedal to the metal, slow down, or should we hit the brakes altogether? And just as I expected, we have a crowd that's very excited, enthusiastic, and interested in this topic, would like to see it progress, but also probably with some safeguards. And the last question on the balance, do you think that AI is more likely to do good? Is it going to be our savior? Or is it going to do harm and end life as we know it? <laughs> no pressure. On the balance, on balance, if we were to weigh it on the scale, And thank you for all the likes. So it looks like we have a leaning definitely in the direction that it's going to do good, but some cautiousness about the harm that it could, it could create. Well, thank you so much for your feedback. And I do want to say that we are excited to get that and doing more surveys across the state to learn where Nevadans land when it comes to AI and their interests and concerns in policy and share that with you in our research in the months ahead. But it is my distinct pleasure to offer or to, um, to introduce our guest speaker, Russell Wald. And I have to say, I drove down to Stanford to go meet with him right before Christmas and I was really excited about this topic before and I came away even exponentially more excited because once we started talking, and this happened again today, it was just a great conversation that was full of so much insight and storytelling, and we're so grateful to have him here. He serves as the deputy director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Before that, he was the managing director for policy and society. And he is a co-author of various publications in AI, Building a National AI Research Resource, Enhancing International Cooperation in AI Research, The Centrality of Data and Compute for AI Innovation, a Blueprint for a National Research Cloud. And currently, I found this so interesting, he's working on a project titled Addicted by Design, an investigation of how AI-fueled digital media platforms contribute to addictive consumption. Additionally, he serves as a member of the AI Index Steering Committee, an annual report that does a deep dive that, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, is extremely informative, and the new one is coming out in a few months. We're looking forward to it. In 2014, he co-designed and led the inaugural Stanford Congressional Boot Camp and has since created numerous tech policy boot camps, establishing a strong and effective tradition of educating policymakers at Stanford and enhancing the collaboration between governments 
and higher ed. Prior to his work at Stanford, he held numerous roles with the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. He's a visiting fellow with the National Security Institute at George Mason University and a former term member with the Council on Foreign Relations and the Truman National Security Project. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Russell Wald. Thank you. Russell, we're so delighted to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And we're also delighted to have his mother here tonight. Thank you for coming and raising such a good son. <laughs> so let's start with the basics. What do we mean when we talk about artificial intelligence? Yeah, first I wanna thank everyone uh, for inviting me and hosting me here in Reno. It's been incredible and I'm really excited to be here. And thank you to the Gwynn Center and you and your, uh, all of your colleagues. Um, I think that uh, survey we just did, it was pretty interesting and telling. Right now, if you're in the, uh, listening to the news or hearing uh, from the media, what you're hearing right now is AI is either gonna fix everything or it's gonna kill us all. <laughs> and I think that there's somewhere in the middle and a lot more nuance to that and hopefully we can demystify a little bit of that for you. So AI, um, as Jill has just noted, it's actually been quite uh, part of our lives uh, for the last few years and has been a field of study since the 1950s. So this is nothing uh, necessarily new. Uh, you didn't know when your Uber driver made a left or a right that it was AI powered. You sat in the back and probably just played it on your phone. What's fundamentally different now and what you will start to see more and more is this coming out of the labs and into the fingertips of people. And what does that mean for society? Where we are right now in AI and what it ultimately, ultimately means uh, is we've entered a phase of what's called the deep learning revolution. And what happened here is just a confluence of time and uh, expertise that brought together a unique level of computational resources this expansion in data that we have because of the internet and this surveillance style society we live in has collected all of this data. And then the introduction of what we refer to as neural networks. And just to keep that really simple, it was inspired by what we see in the human brain and it's actually being applied in these type of networks that help us think faster. And that's what's given us this recent breakthrough and what we're currently in right now. What is it ultimately, in my view, I think, as you said, uh, with the Greeks, humanity has always looked to uh, other tools to be able to help us within our daily life. And ultimately, what we'll probably have is a tool that will be able to be just as smart as us in some areas, and will be able to help do things better in a superhuman era or, or, or do things in, a, in superhuman areas beyond what we could be able to do as humans. So we've come a long way from building, making fire, is what right. you're saying. <laughs> Absolutely. We didn't make fire, we just learned how to use fire, right? <laughs> right. Um, so how would you distinguish AI from automation? Because I think sometimes they get confused. Yeah, so uh, something doesn't have to be AI for it to be automation. But there's kind of a concept that's been talked about. Everything is considered AI until it's a little bit more adopted, and then we just consider automation in a daily part of our lives, and so we don't give it much credence or think of it. So right now, you're seeing things that are new, that are um, exciting or that are happening, uh, and we have, in some cases, an excitement towards it or an aversion to it. But as humanity starts to accept and adopt some of these things, I think of, I remember uh, being on the childhood playground and hearing, uh, no, you're a test tube baby. Does everyone <laughs> remember being a test tube baby? Well, how many uh, today, how many people actually engage in vitro fertilization and are now able to have families that they were never able to have? And at that time, we referred to it as something as scary and weird and different. But today, we actually just consider it a part of our daily lives. And so that's a similar part with AI on that area of automation. It ultimately will be, uh, there will be parts of it that we'll start to accept in our daily part of our lives and it will be AI powered, but it will uh, create an automation in our daily lives. 
Is that? Absolutely. Okay. And so I would say that Stanford HAI is AI positive, looking for the benefits and the opportunities. And so let's talk a little bit about the uses and the benefits of AI and everything from healthcare to education to government applications. So starting with healthcare, tell us about some of the exciting things that are happening with AI and healthcare. So the three areas of healthcare that kind of come to my mind that have me a little bit more excited right now. If 2023 was the year of the language model because of ChatGPT, I will say by the time around 2025, we might, it might be the year of uh, pharmaceutical discovery or more, uh, incredible advancements there. Why? Because what happened was a few years back is Google, their division of DeepMind actually did something that was called AlphaFold. And what it essentially did, and I'm not going to get into too much detail about this, but it allowed for us to map the protein structure of proteins, which was actually quite, has historically been very difficult to do and very incredibly time consuming. It can take someone an entire uh, attempt uh, to get their PhD and their doctorate to figure out how to map out one protein effectively. Now what you're ultimately gonna be able to have from this is the potential for targeted uh, drugs and actually for people with rare diseases who will not be able to have uh, are a normal part of the patient population and therefore uh, it's harder for them to get uh, any kinds of drugs uh, for this. So I think there's going to be an explosion in therapeutics that's going to uh, ultimately will start coming from this. That's one area that's uh, exciting so to me. So it could cut down the time of research from years to months Correct. to get to, Correct. Get to market. Yeah. So that's essentially what a lot of AI is doing. It's just truncating uh, time. I think we used this earlier, um, and I don't want to deviate too much from healthcare, but uh, right now you have people, the mathematician who their entire lives is a pure mathematician. They're trying to solve this one problem and, they're, and they've worked on it for 50 years. They're hoping to leave their work behind and someone 50 years after that will come and solve it. And instead what's actually happening is it's being solved tomorrow. And what does that mean? We're on the cusp of new knowledge that we don't even know how, what that ultimately will mean for all of us. Yeah. But back to healthcare in that aspect, um, Another area is uh, imaging yeah. and, what, and, and what we can, uh, the human eye cannot capture what uh, these uh, systems can do in terms of pixelation. And uh, so the ability for, uh, say for instance, a woman goes in for a mammogram screening in January and the doctor takes a look and they say, okay, uh, looks fine, I'll see you next year. And then they come in a year later and they say, oh my goodness, you have stage two, stage three cancer. Well, with some of these systems, what they actually can do much better than the human eye is be able to tell a, maybe a shading or certain pixelations that are actually starting to show cancer that's happened, uh, uh, cell, cellular development. And what it can do is alert the radiologist and say, it's time for her to have to come back in three months, not a year, or maybe six months so that we can actually see if this is a spot issue. So medical imaging is another important area. And then the third part, which is a little bit more complex, but it uh, is really important, is ambient technology. And what this is essentially is in the hospital space, 30% of uh, ICU deaths actually come by virtue of just being in the ICU from hospital acquired infection. And so through ambient technology, we might be able to more effectively care for the patient in that environment through a multitude of sensors with uh, an AI system that's understanding this. And this can not just be for the patient care of, them, of themselves, but even for the practitioners who one area that we see is hand washing, and that actually is where a lot of the infection spreads, and reminder uh, watches or things like that to help them remind you didn't wash your hands when you touched this. Uh, what happens if you're actually in the surgical room? Uh, uh, and gauze that can get left behind can get left in people, and they, you know, they have to account for every piece of that. AI systems will be able to help detect that faster of saying you're miss there's a piece missing here uh, in the accounting of this. So that will be another important part of ambient technology.
Um, amazing, and we'll get to some of the, the other side of the equation um, in the next segment, but let's stay with the benefits and uses. So education, there's a tremendous amount of interest in education and in our state and across the country. Saul Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, said in a recent TED Talk, we're at the cusp of using AI for probably the biggest positive transformation that education has ever seen. And we've heard both concerns and excitement about what AI can do in education. Can you talk a little bit about the uses and the impact of AI in education? So Sal Khan was just out last week and he was at Stanford for a part of our summit. I very much agree with some things that he's saying. You will constantly hear me talk about the good parts of this, but also the bad parts of this. To start on the good parts of this, uh, education actually potentially can work in a very highly tailored way of helping people with discovery of learning disabilities early. Uh, being able to tailor how you, people learn. We all learn in different ways and receive information in different ways. How is it that we can effectively uh, have a better tailored systems to the student? Um, to be a, a, a tad personal, but I, 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 I would just say this, but I think it's really important. M my grandfather um, uh, was, uh, unfortunately, could not read and write, but as a, a, an issue related to a childhood accident. Imagine if he ha was alive today and this, he had this type of system, he would probably be able to be much, he have an agent that worked more clearly with him and was able to get him to be much more functional and uh, have that full level of literacy that he escaped him for much of his life. Um, and I, I, think, I say that just because to personalize how important I think it, some of these things are. Here's the concern, another concern that's bring up, being brought up. And there's going to be a lot of concerns, and I can't paint the, all of them tonight. Um, but one of them is, is uh, part of the uh, educational experience is not just the learning aspect of it, but also what you get through socialization. And if we create systems that are targeting people too specifically and they're learning too un under, much under those areas, you're not really building resilient human beings who are able to deal with a world that uh, when difficult things come in their direction because they've always had an AI agent tailored to them to help them learn more effectively. So these will be constant conundrums that we're going to face related to society and social socialization. Some things that I never would have thought about just right on the surface. Uh, so. We have a lot of government representatives here today. We have a governor who is a former sheriff, and we've seen legislation and uses uh, within government to help with victim notification or with fraud detection or with automating processes to help citizens navigate their way through the labyrinth sometimes of government agencies. Can you talk about some other examples of ways that government is using AI to help serve the needs of citizens? So there is one area I'm most excited about AI, and I hope you ask me that question later. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Just go for it now. It's OK. Scientific discovery, which we can talk about more, because this will be applied in multiple do domains. And ultimately, what you're not going to hear about anymore is an AI discovery. For example, the nuclear fusion breakthrough that happened last year would not have happened if it didn't have AI and ML techniques applied. And what that means is you're going to start seeing this, these applied aspects in all of these areas. And so I think we're about to supercharge scientific discovery in a way that we, we could never th have thought of before. And that's why it's very important that academia continues to have a very uh, important role and seat at the table when it comes to AI. Uh, in regards to one other area, which is your question, I am actually excited about what AI can do uh, for uh, public sector use or government use uh, by, uh, of using AI. Why? Because the reality is, is government is overwhelmed with requests or possibilities or things. So right now it can actually take up to three years to adjudicate a claim with the Veterans Administration. Well, if you need those benefits or claims, three years is a death sentence. So a large part of that is a backlog in paperwork and an ability to just get through things fast enough. So imagine if you were actually, instead of, take it instead of from three, three years to three months, three weeks, that would actually be very powerful. Um, you're starting to see it in use by the Securities and Exchange Commission to be able to detect fraud faster and uh, insider trading, uh, where it would be difficult for a human to do that through pattern re recognition. You can see it uh, in, um, during COVID, uh, 
a lot of uh, un uh, unemployment benefits were difficult to access or to receive because of the overload and demand. I can guarantee you, I bet you Nevada must have struggled with that with so many people who, in the uh, entertainment industry or uh, the hospitality industry. And if you had a chat bot that you could effectively talk to and it could actually talk back with you in a way, you could start to easily, more easily access those benefits. So essentially what I see is, is uh, potentially with AI and public sector use of it, is government being more responsive to people and to their constituents, and I think that that's really important. Excellent. So I want to flip the table here and look at the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> and so kind of what are some of the, the challenges and the abuses that we've seen? And I want to start with bias, because there's been a lot that has been illuminated about bias in algorithms and some of the harms that could cause everything from facial recognition, disproportionately misidentifying individuals with darker skin, and also where we might turn to automation to help automate the process, or AI rather, to help speed up the process of applicants applying for loans or for uh, their FAFSA application or for certain programs or even jobs, and yet AI might integrate some bias into that process if you have English as a second language or you have a certain name. Can you talk a little bit about that dark side and what are some things that we can do in the state of Nevada to mitigate those issues? Yeah, so let's start with bias. Does it exist? Indeed it exists. It exists for a few reasons uh, in these AI systems. One is, is because of the training data that's used. Well, the training data actually often looks at historical data. And if you look at historical data, it has biases that are uh, within that, and then that will be used, and then it gets just reintroduced into the system. Which, but what's even worse is, is it's entrenched in some of those systems, and it becomes much more difficult. That's one. Two, there's a, a very major problem of diversity within the field. And so if you have tr primarily uh, men who are white or Asian who are building these, and that's what the numbers actually show, uh, it's a problem because they're not going to be able to issue spot or understand data sets more appropriately. So if you don't have this broader aspect of different people at the table, it does create a problem. So there is bias that exists. There's bias that exists in humanity and, and we all walk with them all the time. The problem, but what's unique about this is let's just say there is, uh, humans have an 85% efficacy rate towards something. And we might sit there and say, okay, well, this AI system has a 97% efficacy rate, and therefore it's better. And yes, on a net, it is. But if that last 3% of people who are receiving harms or things, that, whether it be a hiring algorithm or a patient uh, uh, algorithm or whatever it might be, if the, that 3% all happen to be black, then we have a huge problem because now it has disproportionately affected one group of people in this and that uh, is becomes then those proportional numbers actually kind of flip when you look at the actual propor proportion towards race and what will happen in that sense so uh, let me give you one really good anecdote about this and the conundrum that's faced with policymakers on this so the 1974 privacy act is a really important piece of federal legislation that uh, has been, uh, had a, a lot of reasons for it, but one of these reasons were people of color were denied loans by banks, uh, by, uh, uh, and it was a very wrong thing, and this was a measure to correct it. So right now, banks cannot, are limited on the amount of racial data that they can collect on um, th their customers. But banks are actually using this technology today and running this and underwriting credit for it right now. But they can't audit on the back end because they couldn't collect the racial data. So now, right now, it's very possible we are re-entrenching the racism prior to 1974 where we have this benevolent law or this well-intended law has created this perverse incentive situation of where you can't collect the data so you are actually are potentially re-entrenching the racism again. So what does that say? Well, first, to one end, to deal with harms on that end, we need auditing systems on the back end. But even if you had auditing systems on the back end, if we don't have laws that would allow for us to collect the data to be able to do the proper audit, that is where that will ultimately rest with policymakers and what they're going to have to do to be able to deal with this. 
simply put, our laws, uh, one, biases happens, two, our laws of today are not met for the moment of AI. Where are we going to tackle that? Are we going to tackle that on the federal level, the state level, or in the courts? Uh, I don't believe uh, anybody should absolve responsibility of themselves in this role and say that we'll wait for the federal government to do something because in many respects, I think it's, it's a difficult problem. I think that there are public policy measures that are being put into place. I think we slightly talked about this for a moment, but uh, you know, aviation in this country is so safe and one reason it's so safe is because of the National Transportation Safety Board. Anytime one of the smallest little incidents happens on a plane, whether it's you know uh, just uh, a, an incident that didn't cause any damage, but it was noted and recorded, to a uh, door popping off a plane mid-flight if you know you fly a, a particular airline, um, that will get recorded, and then that is noted, and then we'll check every other plane. So if you start to see this disproportionate amount of incident reporting that's happening on this space, what you would ultimately do is go back and start to audit systems more effectively to be able to see, we actually see these unique biases specifically. And so what we see when we look at legislation that's been passed in states across the country in 2023 in particular, we saw an increase in legislation establishing task forces to address these systems or requirements for government agencies to audit their processes to specifically look for areas where bias can make its way in. I just have to pull one more thread and that is on the application side of things because I was having a conversation with a friend a couple weeks ago who said that she was sending out these applications everywhere and then found out that they were just automatically getting rejected because she wasn't using the right format. And so it made me think about another potential inequity there, a digital inequity, that if you don't have a, 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 an updated computer, updated software, or the knowledge, or the access, um, that that could be another discrimination in order to get employment. Absolutely, uh, th and we, there's data that has showed uh, where AI was put into place and that there, were, there has been discrimination that happens in, in this uh, space. Um, oftentimes, you know, it, within some of these text-to-image generators of where you can ask a system to make you a picture and say, uh, show me a CEO, guess, guess how many women pop up in that? So. There's these biases that can happen. Well, in a hiring algorithm, it can happen as well. I think we chatted about this for a minute, but you got to share what you shared okay. with me earlier because it's just too good. I, I th I'm sure this is being corrected or has been corrected now, but there are. And if not, college students pay attention. <laughs> there are ways around some of these systems, and so one way around these these systems is is some people have done this, and it turns out it, it can work. You just copy the job description and put it in very small font, all in white, not visible to the human eye. It's at the bottom, put it at the bottom of the thing, and the algorithm will read it and see it, and you'll go to the top of the thing because you have the job description of exactly what they're looking for, and, and every key word is in there, so you'll vault up to the top. So they're not effective always on these things. I just saw my college-age daughters go, hmm. <laughs> hmm. Okay. You'll definitely get a call, probably might get a call back on that. So, All right, let's move on to a topic that was obviously a favorite in this room, um, a favorite fear, I might say, is the impacts on democracy. So an alarming acceleration of the use of uh, generated images, uh, deep fakes to confuse the electorate, uh, uh, imitating our voices, and uh, doing robocalls, that could have a serious impact on democracy and trust. Uh, let's start with the democracy side. We can deal with some of the other aspects of computer-generated images in a moment. But what are some of the things that we need to be aware of, and what are some of the things that we can do about that? So if uh, my most exciting uh, the side I'm most excited about is scientific discovery. The part I'm most worried about is public trust and uh, yes, democracy is a derivative of this, but public trust and the ability to see what we see. I think we might be in an era of where the last of what we've seen online is the last of where we feel confident in its veracity. Um, you're right, you can fake images, you can fake voices, you can fake video, and you'll start to be able to soon 
sophisticatedly fake video. Um, and what does this mean? Well, ult initially I, th I was saying to myself, well, you know, someone, uh, Photoshop can actually create a very effective fake image. Why is that necessarily an AI issue? And I really kind of held uh, my belief that this, you know, the conspiracy theorist of years ago had their 500 person mailing list, had to go to the, uh, get a Xerox, copy them. Him and his wife are probably licking envelopes once a month and getting that out. And they would go to their 500 followers. But now your 500 followers actually are 5 million. And 5 million has that network effect of 500 million, ultimately, what can come from that. And so I actually was thinking, you know, the issue here is not so much AI. AI provides speed, sophistication, and scale. Really important. But it, the responsibility to me uh, lied with the disseminators, and that is the platforms. And the platforms, I felt, have a more unique responsibility on that because of this. Then, and I was wrong, because then the Biden robocall happened, and if I don't know, if no one is familiar with this, in New Hampshire during the primary, there was a synthetic voice of Joe Biden, uh, uh, which is not too hard to make, and t t telling them how to vote or you know something along those lines. That was scary for me because it was a robocall. So it actually, the platforms were never part of this. It went right into people's phones. And so right now, I think we're entering an era of deep concern. And we're, ha as, a, as a society, going to have to ask ourselves, who, who are the verifiers of truth? Who will uh, ultimately tell us that this, this is accurate or it's not accurate? And the other problem is, is I was part of a working group in 2017 after the 2016 election and we were looking at this and we had psychologists who are part of this. Once you've heard a lie, uh, as every minute goes by and every hour, it's harder to take that lie back. Uh, and if you don't prove it really quickly, it becomes set into your mind and it's difficult to disabuse you of th that not being the truth. But the problem even more so with that is, is also because if that lie comported with your beliefs, you automatically were, or it's nearly difficult to ever take that back. Mm -hmm. And so this is an era of where I think people are gonna go into their tribal factions and believe uh, there's this engine of cognitive bias that we're in and we wanna believe what we wanna believe and we will only believe that. And that's a dangerous place for democracy. It's very dangerous. It's hard to um, do anything if you can't first trust and find right. factual information, right? right? And so the other issue of that is that um, we have deep fakes, we have imitations of voices and what have you, and then we also have seen some recent examples where a politician might have actually said it and then came back and said, oh, no, no, that was a deep fake, or that, that, was, um, that was a deep fake, that was automated, right? And so how do we verify? I know there's been talk about watermarks. Georgia just passed a law that it's a felony to use computer-generated AI images in campaign um, literature. There's other states that have passed laws to require disclosures um, if you're using any kind of uh, generated images, um, artificially generated images. There's also, again, talk about watermarks. So what are some of the things that we could take a look at? So first off, on the watermark side, don't get too excited about that. And there's a lot of complexity to that. But what, create, what it does is it opens up a can of worms elsewhere within this whole development. And that gets into the open source versus closed source world. And it's very complex. And we can chat about that over dessert, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but watermarks are always going to be effective in that kind of environment if you have anything with an open source environment because you can remove the watermark. The issue is, is whether you can t technically, and this might ult be where things start to go, is um, watermarking at the point of the capture. So if, we have, if I have my iPhone and I'm filming all of you, at the point of that, there's metadata on the back end of that that we don't see, but that's where you would watermark it. So you would ha watermark everything for authenticity first. And by everything being authentic first, you're able to more do that. So security cameras will have watermarking in them at the point of the actual capturing of it is probably uh, one possible option. But there's not a lot of good 
options out here for this because the presumption is, is that this is a technology that's only within the United States and that's not the case. And there are other people who are building this and there are other countries that are looking to, to, to do this. Um, and if we, th it, we will be, it will be quite hu hubristic of, of us to um, think that we can contain it exclusively within our own laws and what we do here. Hmm. On that positive note, yeah. let's move on to data security and privacy issues. Um, so obviously, data security, privacy issues are have been oh, a wait, major can we, can concern. Wait, can go back to one point though? You, sorry, I just want to, I did, I forgot to say, you, you, there's one imp other important part to, to note about this, and this is, uh, you said this, when something actually did happen, but people say it, because you're in a world awash of synthetic media, that nope, that, that wasn't me, that was, that was AI, or it was AI that happened in that case. Yeah. And while you're trying to figure out that time to figure out whether that was you or not, and it becomes embedded in your brain and all those issues, that's what two scholars actually termed, and it's really important that people understand this, is the liar's dividend. It's the ability of where you live in a world where nothing is true, so if you did something that was true, you can fake your way out of it or lie your way out of it. And that is something we will have to be mindful in the future as well, when people use this environment to their advantage to actually be able to turn that. Sorry, I know That's you want to okay. go back into the data, That's all right. but that's an important part to do. Well, but it also ties into a conversation that we're going to have in a moment about workforce and the replacement of uh, humans, right, with the artificial intelligence that it, it brings us back to that human touch, that face-to-face, -face. nothing's ever going to replace that being in person, and maybe bringing us back to some of those touch points as well. Um, and so back to generated images and then back to privacy issues, uh, we've also seen you know, it used abusively uh, against individuals in pornography, children, famous individuals, uh, revenge porn, things that um, we see more states looking at increasing penalties or addressing this in legislation. Yes, I uh, look, I think where it's used for nefarious purposes, Law enforcement must come down hard, and I think that there must be, because right now we're in a bit of a wild west and we're shaping the rules of the road. So if you actually make the penalty very, very harsh and you have proper enforcement for some of this, it's really important. I think we talked about this, and I was talking about this earlier. Um, the world is, of synthetic voices is going to be very scary because I think we, we've already seen this in the news. Some people getting phone calls from their children saying, I've been kidnapped. I need, they're telling me to give you, you need to wire $50,000 here right now if you don't do it. And here's the wire, do it. They, they will kill me if you call the cops. What would you do? I'd wire, if that was my kid, I'd wire $50,000 in a heartbeat. But this is where this level of crime is going to start happening more in this space of using generative AI to be able to do that. I think that this is one really important part of states and local municipalities need to have uh, serious laws that actually are, are punitive and really make a difference here because you want to stamp that out before it can actually start to fester out of control. I'm going to take us back to the beginning of our conversation where we talked about all the good that's being done in medical research and applications in healthcare. There's also always a lot of concern about patient privacy and data. So what are some models that we might see from other states uh, being able to address that in the state of Nevada? Yeah, so this is an interesting part too. So for any medical providers that are using ChatGPT, you better be careful about the HIPAA laws that are related to that because you're putting patient data inside another form that's gonna come back and how is that gonna hurt you? So there's a lot of privacy areas that we're gonna be concerned about. However, ChatGPT, uh, uh, let's not use ChatGPT, let's just use what we would refer to as uh, uh, ass assistive uh, uh, medical diagnosing uh, in this sense. Uh, there are, is potentially some great promise there, but we're gonna to have to have laws that will allow for that to be able to effectively happen, but we're still protecting patient privacy and data. I'm very careful what I ever put into ChatGPT. I had, um, I know we're being filmed, but I'm just gonna give it a shot anyways. <laughs> I had a Pentagon official tell me, oh, I put, um, I used ChatGPT for military promotions, 
And that made me very, very concerned because all, when it's the military promotion, what you're talking about is the good and the bad of somebody. And you've gone and put in actual data about somebody else. You don't, uh, we, all ChatGPT, we, we all are beta testers right now for them. So we're all helping them refine their product, and that data really matters to not just OpenAI, but to, uh, to people who would love to get into OpenAI and see some of uh, their use. So I'm very, very careful about what I put into there. So we talked earlier over brunch mm -hmm. about the offense and defense, and I want to bring in national security and cybersecurity as a, a sister of two police officers and FBI Citizens Academy. We always talk about how you get into this um, I into this race with criminals that are using it for bad, and we've certainly seen those breaches that have been very costly here in Nevada. So um, talk to us a little bit about how we continue to use AI uh, to maybe help fight crime while we see an increase of criminals using it. Yeah, so again, we should always come back and understand this is a tool and uh, what a tool can do. A knife can help me cut up di uh, meat for dinner, it can also help me cut you up, right? And so it's a double-edged sword in that sense, and this is the same thing even in cyberspace. In cyberspace, it actually can help detect fraud fast, or be able to detect entry and or intrusion into your systems, and it can do this, but it can also increase the offensive capability. So unfortunately, in the cyberspace world, I just see it getting offense, defense worse, often, and just a continual cat and mouse game. And that's where we are on yeah. that. And it's not going to be easy. And you're just going to have to continually adjust. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily an AI problem. I think that's a cyberspace problem that's just going to continue to get harder and better, harder and better. It also speaks to why it's so important that we invest in education and we invest in training and that government does invest in these technologies because it will continue to advance in the private sector and in the criminal world and we we do need to have the resources yeah uh, uh i'm a huge proponent actually for public sector ai investment so one thing that i have been working on since 2019 was the need for a national ai research resource other states are looking into this. Uh, California is look, looking into this. What it, uh, what it essentially is, is uh, there is um, what we see in 2014 during that deep learning revolution that I'm referring to is AI is historically an academic field. And then uh, industry starts to see, wow, this is powerful and we can make a lot of money here. And so there's this cross and you see uh, um, uh, academia slide and you see industry fly up. And according to our AI index in uh, 2022, there were 32 significant breakthroughs in AI that came from industry. There were three that came from academia and none came from government. Mm -hmm. And that is a disproportionate area because what you don't want to, you want to be sure that there's a robust public sector that has a seat at the table to be able to help shape this. An interesting just side note is um, in the 80s, I believe it was a Republican president that helped uh, call for the mapping of the human genome and put in US dollars into that while p private industry was doing that at the same time and there was this race to map the human genome. It was really important, I think, from a public sector perspective that the, uh, the public sector had mapped the human genome just as much as whether the private sector had because you didn't want that exclusively in those hands. We are kind of in a similar moment of where we're starting to expand on this technology uh, academia in particular gives you things like GPS, the internet, all of these bedrock technologies that are later commercialized. Uh, no one would ever invest in GPS because you would be dead probably by the time you saw the return on investment uh, because it takes so long. That's, uh, so it's really important that we have a robust education system in this and that we have uh, different sets of players at the table because if we don't uh, it'll be disproportionately towards uh, industry AI, and that's not a good place for us to be. We need a, uh, which is nothing against industry. I'm very fine with, with what they're, uh, the products that they're trying to make and what, how they are trying to help us in a market that they're creating, but we need that kind of trifecta of government at the table, academia, and civil society, uh, as well as industry. 
I know talking to our three higher ed presidents on the way up the stairs here that there is a tremendous excitement and interest in meeting that demand. But to your point, it's extremely difficult to keep up with the investments in the private side. So it's one more way that we need to just continue to work I would on this. Add this. Here's another reason why you, we, uh, there needs to be public sector investment. We keep talking about regulation, how we're going to regulate AI. Well, the reality is, is even if you had the optimal regulations that held industry's feet to the fire, but still let them innovate, you couldn't enforce it because you don't have the talent to be able to go in to understand this and how it works to effectively enforce it. So if you're not able to teach them at uh, the, the uh, uh, higher education level how this works, then there's no, there's no amount of people that can go in to government to help with enforcement. Yeah. So I want to dive back into the economy. And there's a lot of concern. The International Monetary Fund just two weeks ago came out with a report saying that 40% of jobs will be impacted by AI in the future. And we've heard even more astronomically higher um, estimations than that. So there's a lot of concern about the impact on workforce and displacement. Um, do you think that that is warranted, the concerns? Yes, but I think we sh should think about this carefully because historically uh, there are always new industries or technologies that are introduced. I fortunately don't have to carry a Thomas Guide with me everywhere anymore. I have a phone that will get me to where I want to go. So the Thomas Guide people are probably out of business. What does that mean, right? So we always... Uh, well, Redbox took over Blockbuster and then Netflix took it all Exactly, over, right? Yeah, so. right? So there's always going to be um, needs for adaptation and uh, society has been good at that in the past for this. Um, we, I think, are in a similar moment of this and I think it's really important that we look at this as a tool again. Calculators didn't make us stop doing math. It helped us do better math. It helped us do math that we could have never have done without that. So this is the same aspect of this technology. And I think we we're talking about this this morning. I have a colleague that's a radiologist in the med school. And he was quoted in the New York Times saying this. The, uh, the question is not whether AI will replace the radiologist. The answer is the radiologist that uses AI will replace the radiologist that doesn't. And it's a really important part because I think everyone in this room should understand and not fear AI. You should learn how to use it because you don't want to be one of those people who are left behind. I can go back to the start of my career, uh, early <laughs> career, was when uh, the internet uh, was coming and I worked in a real estate office. And there was a young manager who was in there saying, you, you all better start learning how this works or you're going to be left behind. And there was some of the more senior uh, real estate agents who were just, I don't know, and very concerned and confused. And it turns out now, if you were to do any type of real estate transaction today, there's no way you didn't not use the internet, whether that was from the, uh, the sale, the promotion of it, to the, uh, I just closed escrow on something today. So um, <laughs> Congratulations. thank you. And uh, the email exchange back and forth and all of the paper and documentation. So indeed, you know, Let's not age me too much, but 20 years later, here we are, and he was right. Uh, use it as a tool and use the internet as a tool or be left behind. And that's kind of where we are. And that is where education can play a role in, particularly in higher education certifications, upskilling, reskilling, and industry has a role to play in that too, mm -hmm. to be able to take uh, their employees and upskill and reskill them to adapt. Yeah, and if I could come back to one part of that part of policy making uh, and how we need to think about this, there's going to be moments of where we're going to say, and I used the example of the 1974 Pr Privacy Act, but let me give you uh, a couple of other important things to note. One, uh, there are possible industries that just the bottom might come out from under them with this technology. Because once one does that first mover advantage of sa says, well, labor, I, I don't need this much labor, I can cut it in half, then all of the other, uh, because of labor costs, will be too high with their competitors. They will do, follow suit and do the same. So you could have an entire industry collapse from underneath. So it tells us that we really need to rethink our uh, social safety net and what will happen in those kinds of situations. And we also are going to have to start thinking about the fact that we tax labor but not capital. 
And what does that mean? Because it also and incentivizes then to say, well, then we'll just cut labor then. And you know, that's an easy way to manage some of that. Yeah. So I have one more question before we open it up to uh, the audience. And then actually I have many more questions, but I want to make sure that we have time for you. So um, AI has to land somewhere uh, on a computer. Computers take power and we have quite a bit of interest in data storage in the state of Nevada. And, um, but we also have a lot of interest in meeting our renewable portfolio standards and impacts on us, our environment. And so how can we build an infrastructure that meets our goals of sustainability? Again, double-edged sword. Um, AI will be able to help with sustainability. It'll help us be able to more effectively manage and understand weather data and when's the best time for a plant getting your crop yield or what that might mean. So there's a lot of possibility that can come from it, but you are correct. AI uh, does have a heavy carbon footprint and it also consumes an enormous amount of water to uh, cool all of the high compute demands. Um, over time, we'll get probably better with this to be able to manage this. I think uh, just like AI, where it will be in every sector of our lives, climate change will be in every sector of our lives and it'll be up to every industry to find out how they can reduce their carbon footprint a little bit more. And this is gonna to have to be something that's really, that's gonna to have to happen because the reality is, is the world is aware of AI. So now we have what was probably just some industries or some people using this technology uh, and that carbon footprint was like this, it's gonna get like this because everyone wants to start applying it in their uh, industry and that's gonna be a really important part. Well, thank you for that. And I'd like to open it up for you all to ask a question. Hopefully you've been thinking of some questions that you have for our speaker. So we're going to go back to using our technology tonight, mentee.com. And you can submit your questions, use the QR code, or go back into your web browsers and bring up that website. What are some questions that you have in regards to the good side of AI and the ways that we can use it in our state as well as ways that we can mitigate or safeguard against those concerns. And we have the very talented and astute Christine Callagher who's going to be reviewing your questions and she's going to be looking for common themes, especially if we see a number of you asking similar questions around some of these themes and those will float to the top. So we'll go ahead and go to our first question. As leaders, what suggestions would you give us to guide the transformation of organizations? It's a tough one. Um, be open-minded to the change, but do not fall for Some of this is snake oil. Some of this, people are out there saying that it will fix this or it'll do this for you, and that's not necessarily true, and in some cases, it's outright false. So I think we sh you should be open-minded to the technology and you should start to see, uh, take time to figure out where it will make a difference in this. So if you are FedEx, it might be an issue for supply chains or management of all the planes or things like this and making sure d deliveries get on time. If you are um, uh, <coughs> trying to look at um, I'm trying to, trying to think of something, uh, another industry, uh, someone throw out an industry, uh, you could, uh, banking and financial services, you might be able to, again, do proper credit writing and decision making, so long as it doesn't affect that disproportionate small number. So you, I think you need to find where it's going to affect your industry and how that's gonna make a difference. And it's not one singular domain of AI. Um, my colleague, uh, She's the AI pioneer, Fei Fei Li, and I were just joking. We were in Washington, D.C. last week, and we are saying, everyone's so obsessed with the language model, and it's an important part. And her, her response is, a language model can't help you put out a fire. So because she's a compu computer vision expert, and it, you, know, you could actually use computer vision to be able to tell early or have earlier detection for fires, put them out before they start to spread and become really big and a huge problem. So, every, so I think leaders just need to be open-minded to the technology, not fall for everything, and fi figure out where it's going to fit in specifically into their field and not just think, oh, it's only going to be the language model, could be visual, uh, there could be a visual aids to it as well. 
I will throw in their leisure and hospitality because you asked for an industry. Yeah, uh, so gambling, you could figure out fraud a whole lot faster if you actually had um, uh, uh, computer vision techniques and being able to cap capture people are, uh, engaged in fraud or, or um, cheating. cheating, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Making their money. What policies can the state of Nevada implement to help improve adjudication practices with AI? Same thing. So here's one thing that I will say that's really important is state governments actually have the power to really shape this technology. Uh, the federal government does and the state government does. And what I'm referring to is a backdoor way of regulation. And that's through acquisition and procurement. The purchasing power of states is actually quite significant. By going and saying, we will purchase this technology from you company, uh, you have met these frameworks or guidelines. So maybe that is the National Institute of Science and uh, Technology, uh, Standards and Techno uh, Technology, uh, NIST, their gu guidelines, and use the NIST framework. You have to use the NIST framework or, or before we will purchase uh, this technology from you. It actually can help shape norms within in this. and so. Uh, in terms of use, yes, you could use it across the board. You can use it to, uh, for, for DMV services. You're going to be able, you might be able to use it for, as I just noted, firefighting and the differences it can make within that. So again, there's going to be this broad area of use, but shaping the use and the norms and that entire regime that can come from that will be really effectively done by state governments for, through their purchasing power. Excellent. All right. At what point is it the responsibility of a company eliminating jobs in favor of AI and robotics to provide new job training for the people whose jobs are being eliminated? Probably about the same as it is if, it, if the job is offshored. I don't have a great answer for that. There's not a, 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 an easy one uh, for that and how we have decided to structure whether companies are now responsible to no longer hire someone because they have used some other automated system to help them do that. I don't find that, I'm not an economist, but I would find from most economists that's not necessarily a winning formula. You're probably just in those kind of situations just gonna have uh, industry flight, leave your state uh, in that sense. Where is it better for government and taxation and social safety nets and things like this to be able to help prevent that is going to be probably what's going to be a little bit more important than saying it's a one-for-one -one replacement or something along those lines. I don't know if that's going to be the best pathway. but So you bring up a good point about that flight um, that could result in maybe heavy-handed. I, I know New York has legislation that they've proposed, have not enacted it, but there's proposals out there that there should be a robot tax, right, that if you do replace it that you penalize. And um, so you talked about some of those issues. We also talked about, though, that uh, turnover is costly as well. So there is, in some cases, can be an inherent motivation to retrain and, and replace that person in another area if that company is, avail is able to do that. Right. I also just want to say that there's an important part of work to me that I think gets missed in this. It's, yes, some people work for a job and a paycheck, but work is also a level of dignity and purpose. And that we <coughs> don't, don't presume that uh, humans will lose dignity and purpose and not find other ways of work and fulfillment that can come from uh, this. I think this is just a new phase of humanity we're about to <coughs> enter and where a lot of the current work has been done in this, there's about to be whole new areas of work that will open up, uh, I think, for us. I think we talked about this uh, the, today. Uh, <coughs> does anyone in here know what a prompting engineer is? A couple people do. Okay, so when you're talking to a uh, language model, how you frame that question and how you um, prompt it is really important. And sometimes if you say, imagine I am a CEO of a, a Fortune 500 company and, and want you to, it, it'll help you think from along those lines. Well, um, a few years ago, there was no such thing as a prompting engineer, and now some of these companies are hiring prompting engineers because they need them. So whole new industries are going to open up from this technology as well. <clears throat> All right. Yeah? What question did we not ask you? Oh, um, and what should we be asking? What are some of the most important trends? The most important trends. I'll come back to the scientific discovery side. That really gets me uh, very excited. I think that there are things that we just 
are ill prepared for that we don't know um, that are going to come and those sticky questions or things that we've been thinking about for years and what is that going to unlock for us this new knowledge I saw that that was one of the words that came up on the bubble and kind of increased and I wished it would because new knowledge is about to come our way you know uh, we talked about this earlier too for me I don't use uh, chat GPT to do a lot of work but one area that's actually been kind of interesting is for ideas and going back and forth. <coughs> you, you know the difference of when you're sitting by yourself with a sheet of paper and trying to come up with an idea versus you're with a group of people and whiteboarding and have in that exchange? That is actually a powerful tool for ChatGPT to use. And you can, it's just, for me, it just unlocks this whole other area in my mind that I wasn't thinking about. And it kind of, and you can have a dialogue and kind of build it out. So um, I think this whole, there's something interesting about working in AI right now. For me, it is understanding what being human is more like than ever before, because you're faced with these questions and you're faced with the possibility of this. And one other thing that I'll say too, that I've been telling a lot of people is, every, a lot of people come up to me and say they're not an AI expert, and I have to be honest, no one's an AI expert anymore. They might be an expert in the field of computer science and that singular domain of expanding AI and whether that is transformers and getting to the next transformer model or something like that. But I work in an interdisciplinary institute. I work with law professors, uh, artists, I work with eth ethicists, I work with computer scientists, I work with computer scientists, one in particular who we are here primarily based on her research and work and how she helped unlock the deep learning revolution. Um, but none of, they're all learning from each other consistently because, again, this is a general purpose technology affecting all these different domains. And someone will come and apply their different unique field or their uh, viewpoint on this. So to me, uh, we're all in this together and that no one is an expert in this field anymore and we're all learning as we go. So you mentioned humanity and ethics and I want to end there. Are there any guiding principles that you'd like to leave us with as we venture out into this new realm? This is probably a little too nuanced, but I'm going to leave it because it, it really helps crystallize this. When this institute, which has now just become this big, incredible uh, institute looking at AI, was started five years ago, one of the key pillars was that interdisciplinary look and to look at this. This is a part of the ethics, that there's a variety of, uh, of viewpoints, seats at the table, different, uh, differing views, and how we are, try to work in what we're referring to as team science and apply team science to this. And so what we did is we actually, we're a grant-making organization within Stanford, so we will give faculty grants who apply for big projects. But before they can have even one dollar from us, they have to do what we refer to as an ethics and society review statement. Before they even get started with the technology, they need to sit there and uh, think about this and what are the dual use consequences. So I've thought about it, I'm going to build it. What does it mean? What will it mean for this or that? And uh, I have been on the receiving end of this and it's not a simple checkbox list, it's actually a committee that will take your proposal review and say you didn't think about this or you didn't uh, what would happen if you did X, Y, and Z. Um, so it's important that we're baking this stuff in at the very, very beginning with differing viewpoints and having others who are sitting at the inception point to say, should we build this? What would it mean if we build this and what will happen? And I think, so at the very beginning, we have to be thinking of ethics, diversity, and all of these key aspects instead of trying to catch up and, and apply it uh, after it's been applied in the world. Well, we'll have to leave it with that, and that's a very good place to leave it. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you. You can't be done clapping yet. Let's give one more round of applause to Jill and to Russell.
On behalf of everyone in this room, I thank you both for helping to lay a firm foundation for continued AI policy conversation in our state. And speaking of continuing conversation, are you ready to continue this conversation downstairs? Uh, we, we now invite you to join us downstairs for desserts and dialogue. Uh, please enjoy. Uh, valet service will be ongoing until 9 p.m., so don't worry. Uh, you're not going to be trapped here overnight, although this would not be a bad place to be trapped overnight. But we would appreciate you to stick around and to enjoy a little bit more time together and, uh, and to digest, literally and figuratively, everything that we've consumed here tonight. So as we conclude tonight's program, I do encourage you to follow us, the Gwynn Center, this year. We're set to produce several more policy reports and host other events on artificial intelligence, in addition to our anticipated projects on the economy, education, healthcare, and governance, all to fulfill our mandate to keep you informed and empowered by trusted research and analysis. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I hope you all have a good night.